Good day everyone and welcome to Life Edge, because life just doesn't have to be that mediocre. Today I am filling in for Rick, I'm Harold Muliati, and um, joining us today is our co-host Dr. Susan Nash, and we also have the director of the graduate program of Earth and Energy Resources at University of Texas, Richard Kukla. All right, so Richard, tell us about your uh, program at, at uh, University of Texas. Okay, I am I'm the director of a multidisciplinary graduate program at the University of Texas. It's actually, I think, the only truly multidisciplinary graduate program at UT. Um, it's called Energy and Earth Resources. And uh, we basically use oh, 35 to 36 faculty from across the university in the Jackson School of Geosciences, the Cockrell School of Engineering, Macomb School of Business, LBJ School of Public Affairs, and the Law School to teach our students and uh, have them essentially lead student research. So the whole idea is that energy resource problems in general are inherently multidisciplinary. And really the only way that you can come up with truly sustainable solutions is by having a multidisciplinary curriculum. Our tagline is multidisciplinary studies for interdisciplinary solutions. And we hope that what our students are able to do when they get out is bring to bear uh, backgrounds in technology, in uh, policy and finance to solve energy and resource problems. So. Uh, very diverse curriculum, a very diverse student body. We have about 50 students from half of them from the US. The rest are from many countries around the world. Probably two thirds of them are either scientists or engineers. The remaining third are students with very diverse other backgrounds, liberal arts, uh, social sciences, e economics. And in the course of two years, they essentially complete their master's degrees. It's a, it's a, uh, not a, not a highly structured, but it is a structured curriculum. It has a core curriculum, and uh, then electives that you have to take, and it is a thesis-based degree. So you have a master's thesis that you have to complete in the course of it. And the students go on to do things that are as diverse as the student body is. Um, they, they go into finance, they go into work for state, federal, or international agencies, they work for consulting groups, They a lot of them work for the oil and gas industry. So uh, especially now we're seeing more and more students head in more varied directions, which I think is very much in keeping with what we're seeing on the energy front. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm glad I can hear the description, but Honestly, every time I think about the University of Texas and what you're doing, I think how lucky they are to have you, Richard, because of your background. The, uh, you've been in charge of so many different things over your career, starting in minerals and then going to oil and gas, and then you also were, have been involved in, in so many different countries. Could you tell us a little, little bit about your background and? your career as an executive at ExxonMobil? Yeah. Um, Susan, you and I have obviously talked many times about what we've ended up doing in life, and I have described my career to many people as a random walk. I, I went to Cornell as an undergraduate, kind of got your basic geology, geoscience degree, went to University of Texas for graduate school, and got my a degree in uh, really volcanology. So I studied a big volcanic center in Mexico and my intent for sure was to go into the minerals industry and spend my entire career in the minerals industry. I started there with Exxon Minerals Company and exploring for base and precious metals. 
we closed down our our minerals company within about six years of my starting and then i went to the coal company and then i went to the research lab and then worked in been working basins around the world so it is uh it's been absolutely fascinating. While I've been based in Houston for much of my career, although many different places within the U.S., most of my career has been working on opportunities, really either in deep water on the oil and gas side, in deep water, or on the unconventional front. And and uh, it's it's been quite it's been quite a ride. I. I never would ever want to wave anybody off from career in the oil and gas industry because it's it's very fascinating. But what I get to appreciate now is that the energy world is very 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 different from the one that I saw as I graduated from UT. And this job really gives me an opportunity to broaden my understanding of energy. So that that's the very selfish side of why I do what I do. I, I'm learning a tremendous amount and I, I feel it's given giving me a perspective in energy that I really didn't have before. I, I you know like you're suggesting I work basins around the world. I've worked in many different positions. I, 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 I one of my claims to fame I guess is I was one of two of the senior upstream strategic advisors to our CEO Van Rex Tillerson. So I've had a corporate assignment as well. But um, nothing that really would have prepared me for what I'm doing now from the standpoint of uh, the other side of energy, which is the renewable side, understanding the grid, doing things that... Sounds like we've got experience, a How to do things, done, how to solve problems. I don't think they're terribly different from uh, the oil and gas business to other businesses. But certainly the specifics and the science and oh, um, uh, the issues are very, very different. And, and that, I've, I've just really enjoyed that aspect of my current job. Sorry to interrupt you, but you you're, you got you got uh, cut off by Skype lag right after you started talking about um, renewable energy. Could you, re uh, okay. could you reiterate some of that stuff? Yeah, well, I... I don't know which where where in my discussion of renewable energy, but really what what I the key point is that while my career really exposed me to a very diverse uh, experience in the oil and gas business, and and really what I would call the energy business at that time, uh, the energy business today is very different, and so the renewable side of the business is the side that I'm learning a lot about now, and frankly happens to be the focus and interest of a good number of my students. So now I'm, I feel like I'm broader uh, in, in my understanding of energy and it, it's given me some perspectives that I think uh, I would not have had otherwise. That's great. So, okay, I have two questions. The first one is uh, an intrusive thought about your volcanology and the fact that there are a lot of earthquakes these days around the Yellowstone caldera, which I find to be exciting. And the second one is that you brought um, your, a, power, a couple of PowerPoints that I'd really like to have the audience yeah. see. Okay, well, um, I, I, Susan, I didn't, I didn't hear you very clearly, but um, the volcanology side, of course, it was my graduate education. And, and when I went into the minerals business, it really allowed me to apply a lot of what I learned in school um, based, oh, based yeah, on my graduate the, the, Yellow, the Yellowstone caldera. Yellowstone caldera. Oh, the question was the Yellowstone caldera. Okay, yeah. In fact, yeah. in fact, what I studied in Mexico was a caldera. Um, a caldera that is about the size of the Yellowstone caldera. In fact, it was a very, it's a very large caldera erupted between about 27 and 30 million years ago. is responsible for a lot of the volcanics you see in the Big Bend area in West Texas. So when it vented, it vented to the north. Um, so the the scale of eruption there would have been about the scale of eruptions at Yellowstone. You know, the last several big eruptions at Yellowstone. So we're talking about uh, massive eruptions. And uh, Yellowstone, of course, 
I mean, that's a, that's a, a mecca for volcanologists, although I have to tell you, very interestingly, I did not get to Yellowstone until about two years ago. It was part of my, I called it part of my independence tour. When I retired, I bas we basically got in the car and drove through the Western U.S. and our destination was Yellowstone. And the main reason was, here I was a volcanologist, really not having seen Yellowstone itself. So uh, studied it a lot, but but never got up there. And, and so that was great. Did you did you go to the parts where the um, the asphalt is melting and also where the boiling springs um, are like boiling acid? Yes. Yeah, we did. We I mean, we looked we drove a lot around. We were there. We were at Yellowstone itself for about a week and didn't see the asphalt melting. Although, of course, it happens in places where, where you have start getting um, steam erupting below some of the roads. But you could see the boiling springs below rivers, you know, as so you can see these bubbling rivers and, of course, you know, all of the geothermal systems, the, the geothermal system itself and all the manifestations of the geothermal system were things that fascinated me really to a significant degree because they're analogs for what I used to explore for in the minerals business, looking for epithermal gold and silver deposits. I mean, here were, here are the uh, modern analogs of those sorts of systems. So you, you just go a few, oh gosh, hundreds of meters below the actual surface where you have the hot spring and you're really in the realm of an epithermal system where you might have gold or silver deposition. That's great. So I, it, it just, it's hard to tell, it's hard to describe how much fun that, that was my first career really and, and many people talk about the early stages of their career being the, maybe the most memorable in many ways and it was very memorable. I loved it. I, I worked with a great team of people. I learned a lot. I, you know, we've talked about this before too, but I swore two things when I worked for the mining company, for the minerals company. I swore, number one, I would never go work for the oil and gas side of business. And number two, I swore that I would never move to Houston, Texas. And, and I ended up doing both. And I'll have to say that the the experience I had in the oil and gas industry was just fantastic. It was fascinating. I, 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 I loved it. It's just completely different. The only thing it didn't give me was the exposure to field work outdoors, which is really why I became a geologist in the first place. But I, I found excuses to get out in the field pretty frequently. And so I got that part of it, um, I, I think I was happy enough with. Great. So, um, Harold, do we have the PowerPoints? Yeah. Yeah, I will bring yeah. that up. Okay. So let me let me kind of just this is this is a great shot because a friend of mine, Dave Leary, retired from Exxon Mobil last two yeah last year, and he was driving across the Panhandle and he's kind of become an avid photographer. It took this fairly artsy shot, at least I think it's kind of a fairly artsy shot, but I just love, aside from the composition of it, I, I love what it shows. You know, you see a, a, a tank battery, you see solar cells for part of the control system uh, 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 producing gas well, and then of course in the background you see these big wind turbines. And it's a picture, a picture says a thousand words, but it, it's really a picture of what the energy world is in the United States and in many other parts of the world and and uh, again to, to not to make this point to, too frequently it's so different from the energy world that I faced as I left graduate school which, which was essentially uh, fossil fuels oil and gas and coal and so here you have uh, here you have renewables juxtaposed with uh, natural gas in this case and some oil production and I think it really speaks to both the, the, the well it speaks to the challenges and it also speaks to the great opportunities for um, what I call energy practitioners today they're, they, they're combinations of geoscientists they may be commercial people um, they have uh, policy some of them have policy backgrounds 
but they're they're practicing energy and they're having to deal with a whole range of different sorts of solutions and opportunities and uh, their jobs are, are are very diverse as well and that really speaks to the kinds of graduates that we produce and where they end up going That's great. so susan you know i don't want i, I what i what i thought about in terms of this presentation was uh, talking about ultimately getting to a description of the program and education, really this kind of multidisciplinary education, but I thought it important to set it in context. So I thought the first thing to do would be to talk a little about the global energy outlook and some maybe interesting aspects about it, and then things that I think are particularly interesting dimensions of the future of energy. and. Um, I think the repeating theme will be how how diverse it's become and how stu how students uh, professionals need to be prepared for that. That's perfect. So if we pull up the first slide, I, I think this one's kind of illuminating. All right, the first slide here. This slide is actually from Exxon Mobil's Global Energy Outlook and. You can choose your poison. Um, they're not that different, really, the ones that are done well. And I happen to think this one's done very well. It's, it's produced by the corporate group, and it's really produced with a lot of external input and careful, careful analysis. And I, I urge people to look at this and then look at others to get a broad perspective. But I think they're not overall terribly different. So. What's fascinating about this slide is that it shows that between now and approximately 2040, when, when the point to which this outlook goes, you see a couple interesting things. One of them is that if you look at total energy demand over time, that curve flattens. So the view is that global energy demand over time is, is going to, the rate of growth, it's going to continue to grow, but the rate of growth is going to continue to diminish. And that's, you know, follow the top of the black bar, the uh, gray bar, and you, and you see that fairly clearly. Second point is that if you look at the OECD, the, the mature economies of the world shown in blue, their energy demands from now to 2040 are actually going to be decreasing. And that's a fairly consistent view. So essentially, all of the growth in energy demand, or much most of the growth, growth in energy demand is ha happening in the Asia Pacific realm. Now, one other really interesting point is that that black line that takes off kind of a third of the way across, probably, I don't know, my glasses on right now, put them on, you know, some somewhere around, uh, you know, present day, so 2015, you see it take off and it looks like kind of an exponential curve. That is the projection of energy demand were we not to realize the efficiencies that ExxonMobil thinks we're going to realize in the course of the next 25 years. So it's staggering. It, it is without a question the single greatest source of energy is energy efficiency. And the reason I point to this is because it illuminates one of the areas of energy that many people don't really think about. I, I was a supply guy, supply side guy. In other words, I was looking for supply. However, this is a demand size, demand side dimension of energy. These are pe people who work on this side of the energy business are people who are looking for efficiencies and building efficiencies either into cars or buildings or aircraft or, or whatever processes. And so this is a huge energy business today and really students need to think about it a lot. It's, it's not really the way many people think about energy. They're always thinking about where am I going to get oil or gas or how, where am I going to build my solar farms or, or wind farms. But that's part of the story. The other part of the story is where am I going to save energy? Where am I going to be efficient? Now, if we look to the panel on the right, what we see is, I think, a very fascinating story. And that is, you don't see it in this graphic itself, but energy demand is very, very lumpy. Um, if it weren't for China over the last 15 or 20 years, the energy required by the world would be extremely different. And the reason China has experienced this 
explosion of growth in energy demand and demand for cement and steel and iron ore and all kinds of other things is because of the huge growth of the middle class in China. So the middle class, essentially, it is the producing part of the economy, but it, it is the consuming part of the economy. And so you see that explosion between you know, 2000, 2015 in China, and then what you see between 2015 and 2040 is continued growth of the middle class in China and an explosion of projected explosion of growth of the middle class in India. So there are the two biggest single pieces that are going to determine so many things. Energy demand, CO2 emissions, all kinds of related aspects to, uh, to energy. Uh, just as a point of reference, when you look at China's middle class today, it's bigger than the entire U.S. population. So it gives you gives you a sense of scale. So a few things to think about as you think about energy, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about a couple of these. I, I will tell you that this question of India and its role is, is a, also a fascinating one, and there's a big divergence in opinion as to how big a role it's going to play. Some people believe that India's middle class really doesn't exist in, in, a, in a traditional form and probably won't grow the way some people project and other people say it's going to explode. So I think that is a uncertainty that people need to think about as they think about energy demand in the future, but it's a very important part of energy demand. This is very interesting. I think it's an interesting context, and, and I really like what you're saying about the role of, of new technologies and efficiency. Yeah, it, 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 um, there, there are companies now, in fact, there, there happens to be one company that supports our program with a generous fellowship called Clear Result in Austin, Texas. They're a big company, and that's their entire business. Um, they are focused entirely on consulting in the energy efficiency realm of, of uh, the business. And, you know, that is part of the energy business, and, and people really need to think about it, and it's fascinating. It's uh, commercially interesting, it's technically interesting, and it's, it's so different from the business that I was in. Well, don't you think that one of the big um, change agents will be when we can improve batteries and storage of the um, solar and other renewable energy? Say, Susan, say that again. Uh, the okay. Are you asking about storage aspects? Yes. Yeah, so the next big step change could be when we get to um, better storage. So when we have yes. like improved yeah. lithium yeah. batteries, etc. For sure. So, I mean, there is no question that as you look at renewables today, and we'll talk about talk a little bit about this uh, further on, intermittency is still the, the biggest single issue. On a, on, a, on a unit cost basis, wind, for example, is competitive today without subsidies. Um, solar with subsidies is competitive today. But even if you take away the subsidies, the longer term projections are that technology is going to make wind and solar on a unit cost basis very competitive with natural gas. In fact, probably cheaper than natural gas. But intermittency remains a big issue. Now, there are several ways to address intermittency. The best and most efficient way today really is with probably natural gas. The, the, the natural gas, you can build these fast ramping peakers that um, are about probably 50 to 60 percent more efficient than a battery solution. But the battery solutions are, are, there, are, are the target. They're in the crosshairs. And so you're probably familiar with the Tesla story in South Australia where, where Tesla delivered their commitment to, to this big battery farm that went along with the wind farm. And it there are big arguments as to whether it was the most cost-effective solution, probably 50 to 60 percent more effective, more costly than natural gas, but they were able to deliver it very quickly and they addressed a key problem that, that people were having there. So yes, long answer to your question, batteries are a enormous piece of this overall equation. Well, and another another one is, and that's one reason I love that photograph, uh, is that 
it shows how hybrid solutions are, are really part of the issue, especially yeah. in remote locations. I'm thinking yeah. of solar uh, solutions, solar used to heat steam and, and used in enhanced recovery for heavy, heavy oil, for example. Susan, you, you froze up there for a second, so I missed, may have missed part of what you said. But I, I love the hybrid solution piece of this is spot on. And hold that thought, because we're going to look at a, a slide that is going to make that, that uh, point in space. Are we just going to this next slide here? Yeah, well, look, this, this one isn't exactly that point, but let me, let me speak to this, because it really talks about the, you know the world's need for energy and, and this is where where you, you can't you can't in any way shape or form get away from the fact that energy is going to be such an important part of the world's future and, and everyone's prosperity um, i love this map right here the world at night and many people use it as a proxy for population and it is to a degree but really what it's a proxy for is electrification and electrification is probably the best proxy for prosperity rather than energy. And let me try to make that point on the right side of this graphic. And what I've outlined is the country of France and the country of Nigeria. Well, France, uh, Nigeria has about three times the population of France. And effectively, aside from a little dot at Abuja and Lagos, it's dark. France, of course, is, you know, Paris is called the city of lights. France is the country, a country of lights. It's very well lit up. So it's not just population, it's electrification. And, and when you understand how electrified a country is, then you understand how prosperous it can be. Interestingly, all the bright lights you see immediately to the southwest of Nigeria, those are offshore natural gas flares. So that is the, the irony of all this energy that is actually going up the stack into the atmosphere. So um, this the, this is kind of the challenge of the world is to is to bring electricity. How can you say you could never say that energy Nigeria is not an energy rich country? It is an energy rich country in terms of natural resources, but it is experiencing its citizens experience energy poverty. That is, they don't have they they're not the beneficiaries of it. Of, uh, electricity and uh, that then translates to how fast people can advance and prosper so really that was the point of this uh, of this slide I just think it's energy is such an important piece of this this overall future story and where it comes from of course is what all the debates are about right now oh absolutely so I, I put an additional slide in here that I love. And you know, I, I, I'd be curious what you think of it. If, I, if you pull it up, I'll talk you through it. Because it, it, it illustrates then another dimension of energy evolution. No, it's not that one, it's the one before that. Here we go. Yeah, there you go, right there. Okay, so let's look at this. And what we're going to look at from 1850 to present day and beyond present day is U.S. energy demand as it was satisfied by different fuel types through time. So what we saw is that, you know, in the mid-1800s, the economy was basically powered by wood. And then with the, with the start of the Industrial Revolution, it was driven by coal. And with the start of transportation, oil became a key player, and then really gas emerged beyond that. Nuclear has come in. Um, you can see the, the, the bright blue piece of nuclear, and, and a projection that ExxonMobil has that it's going to grow considerably in the future, and it, it is growing in places like China, though not in the U.S. And then renewables, which seem to, to, to comprise a very small piece, they're growing very rapidly, and we're going to come back to this point because it's important too. So, what is key about this slide? Well, as you go from wood to coal, carbon atoms per atoms of, of hydrogen. And that means that when they burn, they produce more CO2 and less energy per unit. That you per, so their energy density is, is lower. 
So essentially, when you look at this scheme, what you see is the United States has gone through a long cycle of decarbonization, which has been entirely driven by need, not driven by policy. And so we, because of our needs right now, we are seeking more and more energy dense fuels. And of course, because of concerns over uh, of climate, over climate change, we're seeing, seeking fuels that have a smaller and smaller carbon footprint. Now, one point that I make, uh, one little note that I make on here is where India of their energy sources, and you can see that, and it's approximately in the time frame of 1930, 1935. So the question we have to ask ourselves as we look at these two countries, which are really going to drive energy demand in many ways, is are they going to follow the same progression the United States has followed, or are they going to be the beneficiaries of all the technology that's been developed over that period of time, and are they going to essentially leapfrog to uh, a lower carbon sort of energy solution uh, that is what everybody hopes. Uh, the, the near term, with regards to that, has not been particularly encouraging. Carbon coal consumption in, in Asia has grown 60% in about the last 10 years. Uh, it's diminished in North America by about the same amount. So this is a, a really big issue as regards uh, CO2, for example. So a thought about how energy transitions occur and how two big countries that are going to drive energy consumption in the future uh, may transition and hopefully leapfrog to solutions that have been developed over all that long period of time. So now, now let's, let's flip to the next slide because it shows a snapshot of the United States. And, and let me explain what this analysis did. It was done by the Energy Institute at the University of Texas. And what they did is they looked on a county by county basis at the levelized cost of electricity and essentially the lowest cost solution, the, the, the most technically, fa technically favorable solution for each county in the United States. They did this study looking at um, levelized cost without externalities and with externalities, uh, without considering things like availability, which means where you can do some of these things. You can't build wind farms on, on, uh, in certain areas. You can't put solar farms in certain areas. So this slide takes into account externalities and it takes into account uh, issues of availability. When I talk about externalities, they're simply recognitions that, for example, if you coal, and those have a cost, and those are fairly accepted, albeit debated, but accepted costs, and those are built into these overall solutions. So when you look at this map, what you see, first of all, I think the first order of look is, it's, it's a patchwork of all kinds of colors. Now, there are big patches, for example, the patch of green that goes right out the mid-continent. It should not surprise anyone that the mid-continent, uh, Susan's hair today, uh, uh, evidence of, of wind power, goes right up through you know, West Texas, Oklahoma, into, into the northern U.S. And there you can make, their wind is the best solution. If you look at Arizona, Southern California, no surprise, solar is the best solution. If you look at a lot of other places, uh, uh, natural gas is the best solution. In this study, there was not a single county, of course, when you considered externalities and availability, where coal was the best solution. So coal as a fuel source is, is collapsing under all of its, uh, all its deficiencies. In spite of the huma, huge benefit it's provided in moving, oh gosh, the United States, Europe through the uh, Industrial Revolution. Okay, so you sit back and look at this, and what you say to yourself is, gosh, as energy is concerned, there are all kinds of different opportunities. It could be wind, it could be solar, it could be natural gas, nuclear may play a bigger role, but it's not uh, the, the more simple picture that, that I would have confronted as, as I looked at the United States. So this is a mature economy with a mature energy economy. I'll, I'll call it that. And this is 
uh, this is to where China and to where India will ultimately evolve. And one one will imagine one might imagine that the, the different parts of India and China, respectively, will look for the technologically best solutions, and they will be considering, of course. Unit costs of power, they'll be considering externalities at some point as well. You know, people in Beijing are not happy about the amount of smog, although that's not a CO2 issue as much as a as much as it is a particulate issue. So a, a perspective really on the diversity of energy supplied in a very mature economy, you'd, you'd see the same thing in Europe and really speaks to why, if you're going to go into the oil and gas business, you darn well better understand what the wind business looks like or the solar business looks like, because that's your competition. You're going to be going head to head. In fact, exactly that's happening in the power business right now is, is natural gas, this is going combined cycle natural gas is going head to head with wind and solar. And wind and solar are achieving very large gains in terms of providing power to the new economy. So just a, a perspective, I think, that requires all energy practitioners to have a pretty broad view of energy. Well, we are about at the end of our time, but that these are some really interesting um, perspectives and research on uh, what what's going to be driving the energy industry in the future. and. Um, we always ask one question of our guests on Life Edge, and we'll be probably closing with that question. The question is, sure. what is the one thing in your life that you feel has given you an edge? There, that is a really easy answer. Um, a, a just passion for learning. I, 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 I can't... I can't describe how much I enjoy that aspect of it. And that's really, I think, a lot of the reason why I feel very fulfilled doing what I'm doing. Um, it, it can be really simple. I, I, can be, I can be stuck in my mind on an issue that I'm dealing with and it's in front of me all the time, but I really don't understand it. You know, it's one of those kind of nagging things. You're doing it, you're kind of going through um, going through the motions, you're using this knowledge, but you really don't understand it. And then all of a sudden, you learn where that crystallizes. And all of a sudden, you have a deep understanding of something that you were doing, but you didn't really want to acknowledge you didn't understand very well. So that's just tremendously satisfying. And as you look at energy in particular, if you are not committed to continuously, continuous learning, you are going to be obsolete in no time. And that it has to be another learning for any energy, any graduate coming out of the Energy and Earth Resources Program. If they think for a second that what they learn there is going to propel them through a, a lifelong career, they're, they're crazy. And, and I, you know, I'm going to tell them, I do tell them that's not the case. You're, you're continuously learning, and if you don't do that, um, obsolescence is is where you end up and you don't want to do that so in my case it's just fun I, I really enjoy learning I'm gonna I'm going to continue learning until my mind completely fails me and I think there will be no reason to ever stop because especially now things are changing and evolving so rapidly I mean technology the, the dimensions of technology I, it doesn't matter if you're in deep water or if you're looking at solar or wind, they're evolving exponentially. And um, that is an uh, almost unfathomable unfathomable for the human mind, that sort of pace of change, and yet somehow you have to keep up with it. And your career has really been exemplary of that passion for learning. I mean, you've stayed sort of in the energy industry, but you started out with geology, yeah. volcanology, and now you're kind of going from end to end in the in the field of energy yeah right I and, and it, it you know it's been interesting because every one of those transitions sometimes are challenging and sometimes difficult and this is what I tell a lot of students is that you, you, you do those sorts of things you have to embrace the challenge because it's going to be 
uh, you're not going to be the smartest guy in the room right off the bat. And I don't consider myself the smartest guy in the room in any area because I'm humbled by how many things I, I have yet to learn. But it's really embracing those sorts of learning challenges that, that then get you kind of up to the next level. And then you have to look for something else. And in my case, I've almost been thrown into successive opportunities where I've had to learn. Um, it, a lot of it hasn't been through planning. It hasn't been through my own kind of planning, personal planning or design. It's just happened. And it's been, it's been great. Great. Well, that's where being receptive is so important to and, and identifying the opportunities. It's very much um, a way to live and an inspiration. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Agree. It, it, it is. And it's, well, I mean, if it weren't fun, then I guess if, if learning weren't fun for me, it is. If it weren't fun, then maybe it, it wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do it the way I want to do it, but it is fun. And so uh, it's it's really not an effort. It's just kind of part of who I am and uh, who I hope I will be for, for the rest of my life. That's great. Yeah, so you're, you've really been about learning and now you're, you're teaching, so you're allowing yeah. others to yeah, learn. Right, and so now I, get to, now I get to share what I've learned. And the interesting thing, of course, is it's not like somebody in my position gets to sit back and pontificate about all the things I've learned because a lot, a lot of the things I've learned are wrong and obsolete. I, I talk a lot about unlearning. I mean, you, you, I have had to unlearn a lot of things. And you can't learn new things unless you unlearn, unlearn things that you were taught that were flat out wrong. And, and as I transition from conventional resources to unconventional resources, I just can't tell you the number of things that I've had to unlearn. I can't tell you the number of things I've been told unequivocally were a certain way and are not. And, and that's, that's what my job is in part two, is learning with the students. And, and I think that then provides an example to students of what I think they should aspire to if they want to be successful scientists or business people or policy makers. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming on our show. And uh, I think this has been a really eye-opening overview of the geographical and historical context of where we are today with uh, energy in the world. Great. Thank you. I, I, I've enjoyed it, and uh, I will look forward to future conversations with lots of people, certainly including Susan. Yeah. Well, thank you. And we will uh, we will link to to the page for um, Richard's uh, graduate program in the description, so you can check that out if you want to look look more, look into more about his research. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. This has been Life Edge, and we will see you next time. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.